Um, so thanks, Nikki. Um, I want to welcome everyone and just thank you for joining us today. This is our first lessons and recovery and resilience speaker series session of the year. So today you're going to hear some from some incredible individuals. And we're going to start with a presentation from Dr. Sue Brand about the transgenerational transmission of trauma, followed by a panel discussion with experts and individuals with lived experience. So <clears throat> I hope we can provide some valuable insights for you today. And I just wanna take a moment to thank our speakers and our moderator and the Tuesday's children's staff that have helped with this event. Um, Sarah, Nikki, Jen, and Preeti, big shout out to you for putting this all together. Um, and so I'm just gonna start, jump right in. I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. Sue Grand. Uh, Dr. Grant is on the faculty of the NYU postdoctoral program for psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, uh, the In National Institute for Psychotherapies, the Mitchell Center for Relational Psychoanalysis, the Psychoanalytic Institute for Northern California, and she is a fellow at the Institute for the Psychology of the Other in Boston. She is an author of The Reproduction of Evil, A Clinical and Cultural Perspective, The Hero in the Mirror from Feared Fortitude, and she has written and co-edited multiple works on the topic today of transgenerational transmission of trauma, including her new co-authored book, Transgenerational Transmission, A Contemporary Introduction. Uh, she also has a private practice in New York City and in Teaneck, New Jersey. So welcome, Dr. Grand. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Tuesday's Children. It's a wonderful organization that uh, was created to help the children after they lost their parents in 9-11. And as the generations yeah. grow up and there are new generations coming, the organization has clearly expanded and really thought about its mission and it's always growing and I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, the issue of transgenerational transmission is of course becomes important as even just from the perspective of what happened on 9-11 that there are subsequent generations growing up now. And uh, you know, what will it be like as these children becomes adult, become adults and they have children and grandchildren, what will these what will be communicated across the generations about what happened and how will the feelings about it and the perspectives of it evolve and be manifest. So I just also want to say <clears throat> that this topic is one that I've been interested in for a very long time. And I have my own transgenerational history as I think as we reflect on it, most of us do in some way. Uh, my father was an American Jewish soldier who liberated Dachau. And also my grandparents were uh, immigrants who fled from the violent pogroms that occurred in the Ukraine in the early 20th century and late 19th century, uh, late 19th century. And there was, for example, nobody spoke about what happened in the pogroms or why they came or who, got, who uh, was killed or who they lost. There was more communication about the Holocaust, but in a very confusing and problematic way. And um, what I found in my life is that <clears throat> the, uh, the inheritance that I carry from these things, as you'll probably discover in your own lives, and in what we hear from these other panelists, that what we experience is both what I would call unconscious and um, interpersonal and emotional experiences that are shaped by it, that we don't necessarily even realize are shaped by it. And they can be shaped by it in both uh, painful, um, negative ways, and also in some very important ways that are ethical and caring and loving and involve a lot of resilience and adaptability. So for example, I inherited uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of different kinds of fear that would come up in situations that I had no idea why I was getting scared, why my heart would beat like that, why I would be um, afraid to speak or be in the foreground of anything or be noticed. But at the same time, I uh, received an ethic 
uh, that I received very clearly from my father, but also from my forebears, that sometimes we are the persecuted group and we need the help of others or we're the oppressed or deprived group. And sometimes it's somebody else and we need to stand up for them. So uh, I inherited a commitment to some kind of social justice orientation that cares about the other and that goes through all of my work for, since I became a psychologist. So a friend of mine <clears throat> uh, whose grandparents were also in the, uh, suffered from the pogroms and it's likely that her grandmother was probably raped during the pogroms, um, spent her life fighting for the healing of women who were sexually abused. So we inherit strengths, we inherit ethics, we inherit values and guiding principles and all sorts of forms of resilience and wisdom. And we also inherit um, a lot of emotional difficulties, ways of being in our relationships that are not healthy and not loving even. Um, and uh, this can also affect all kinds of aspects of our lives. I also want to say, because it's very, very important, that in my work, I always connect this to, I'm very concerned, given my heritage, about um, cultural and political disruptiveness. And we're living in a world now where people are increasingly anxious about climate change and refugee crises and wars and genocide and scarcity, pandemics. And um, you know, my, my feeling is that the more we face these struggles, the more we're challenged to be humane and compassionate and to care about the other and create community with the other and find a more peaceful solutions to difference and conflict. But cultures also have heritages of trauma. And what I'm gonna talk about now is that <clears throat> the difficulty is that for the original, let's say, generation that suffered from mass trauma, there's often a, a, a kind of breaking of the self. And, and often you lose connections, you lose relatives, you are displaced, everything that was normal in your life disappears. And so by to survive and endure, there's often a dissociative process in basically I can't live and try to go forwards and try to survive this if I just feel all this pain all the time. So I dissociate it, I push it away, I numb it, I put it in a box somewhere. The problem with that, and it can be very uh, helpful, the problem with that is dissociation like that never works completely. So the survivor generation often has there are manifestations in the survivor generation of the pain that they suffered that they're trying not to deal with. Even if they're silent, like my forebears were about what happened in the pogroms, and many families are, there are signs and symptoms and reenactments and important things that appear in a family and in multiple generations that on the one hand are treated by the family as if they're normal. That's just how my family is. And on the other hand, they're um, odd. Maybe they're scary. Maybe they make you wary of the, you know, everybody's very wary of the world. Um, maybe everybody's very suspicious of the world. Um, maybe everybody has some kind of eating problem. Um, maybe the person, the survivor generation is warm and loving and vital and active and engaged. And all of a sudden they're very depressed and very withdrawn and they won't tell you why, uh, or they're cut off or they're frightened of strange things. I had a patient who his mother was a survivor of the Armenian genocide and he had a very good life. His mother was a, a warm, loving woman, but she would be very cut off sometimes and sob and she would never tell him why. And when he was an adult and he had children of his own and later grandchildren, uh, where he would have panic attacks if he had to assert himself in any with the smallest way. He also, uh, everybody in the family would joke because they would take a book out of the bookcase and find tuna fish cans hidden behind the books. 
And dad, why are you always hiding canned food behind the books? And it was a joke and it was a little compulsion and everybody just tolerated him. And he had no idea why he was doing it. Well, he was doing it because there was such a history of starvation and dislocation. So the um, there are these indications that happen in the moods of our forebears, in the ways they handle life, in the way they respond to us, in the way we respond to the world, uh, even in the way they see our political and cultural challenges. And so children uh, develop, children have wonderful rich fantasy lives and they build up stories. And sometimes the stories are conscious stories and sometimes they're what we call unconscious stories. So a conscious story um, would be more like uh, a Holocaust survivor hearing that a relative had been sent to concentration camps. And then this happened to a colleague of mine when her it was time to go to summer camp. She was a little girl. She didn't know the difference between the two camps. She just knew she's being sent to a camp and she had a terror meltdown. And it took a while to understand that she had mixed up the word camp, right? So um, children absorb stories, they create their own fantasy stories. And sometimes these are heroic stories and sometimes they're terror stories. And often in our lives, we don't even know that we have these stories. We just live in our lives the way we can, sometimes struggling with self-esteem, all kinds of issues in our lives, but we go forward and we don't generally know that we are living out and experiencing some things that came from people who came before us both the good and the problematic. And one of the things that the theorists in my field <clears throat> suggest is that unconsciously, uh, through the soup of all these communications that we receive in families and in cultures, that we receive kind of messages, unconscious messages from our family, from our forebears uh, about the, the historic traumas of our culture. And they can be heroic stories, uh, and missions uh, to do something good, to be a rescuer, to save people, to be compassionate, to care for the other. Um, they be, also can be uh, messages around vengeance, around seeking unrelenting search for justice and restitution in ways that are corrosive and um, problematic and disrespectful of other people hurtful to other people, uh, but that we feel, and this is one of the great problems in our environment, in our families, in our world, is that there's a heritage of transgenerational transmission, a sense of victimization that is correct historically. But there can be a kind of legacy of a chronic victim story in which members of the family or even a whole culture feels perpetually victimized. They don't really know the real history of where this came from, but this is like an open raw wound. And so they feel entitled to a restitution in the wrong places, to um, getting their own back, to kinds of privilege or being exempt from uh, certain laws or norms or um, ethics or considerations of the other. Sometimes this just looks like a very, very narcissistic family member who always feels they're a victim and always feels somebody else is to blame and always feels like everybody owes them something and has to make up to them for something. And they feel very entitled. And the feeling of this both hunt for revenge, for getting your, your own back, for making someone pay, for perpetually seeing yourself as a victim, for feeling that <clears throat> you deserve something in compensation from people who had nothing to do with what happened to you, um, means that you can move through the world feeling like a victim, feeling everything hurts you, you're insulted everywhere, you're injured everywhere, nobody understands you, uh, but actually, in fact, doing some very harmful things. So, you know, the, the heritage of legitimate anger, helplessness, 
the quest for some kind of repair and justice, uh, the need to vent your rage somewhere, the need to uh, feel that the world owes you something. This is a legacy. And if we don't know where all this really came from, and we don't really know our history, whether it's in our families and our history of, you know, why is my the child of the Armenian genocide terrified if he has to so much as send a meal back at a restaurant because they gave him the wrong food? Uh, why does his start, heart start to pound? And his wife says, send it back if, if it's the wrong thing. No, 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 I don't really send it back. No, I'll eat it. You know, that kind of timidity. Where is that coming from? Why And so this patient could never ask for a raise or an advancement, right? So it's affecting his whole life until he came to understand where it was really coming from and that he was empathically, intimately connected to his mother and what his mother had suffered. And that when the waiter brought the wrong food yeah. and he felt angry and the need to assert himself, he was thrown back into something about someone being abused horribly in his family and how dangerous it is to speak up, to speak back because those people would get killed or beaten, right? So understanding where that history comes from generally relieves a lot of stress and a lot of pain and a lot of these sort of stuck victim narratives. It releases us into our own worlds and allows us to mourn and have compassion in a more explicit, a caring, thoughtful way about, well, who, what did my mother go through? What did my grandparents go through? No wonder they were kind of weird. No wonder they were afraid to let me go out and play with anybody because they were afraid of the world, right? So you also can be maybe less resentful of some of the neurotic things that your families did to you uh, because now you understand where it came from. They couldn't help it, right? But you can do it differently. So part of uh, the work we need to do, all of us and in cultures also, is to understand what, what are these residues that we're having? What, uh, what things are we carrying that we can let go of, that we ourselves don't have to feel those feelings of terror or rage or entitlement uh, or timidity anymore, what we can do instead is we can have compassion and understanding for what happened to our forebears, to the way the generations managed it going forward, and to also think more consciously, okay, this is my legacy. Uh, what do I admire about how my forebears or my culture or my political world handled this? And what do I want to keep with me of what I learned from them that's good, their resourcefulness, their adaptability, the way they helped other people, even in the midst of a terrible tragedy like 9-11? Uh, do I want to hold on to that? Or um, do I want to devote myself to some activism that helps people in this world? Uh, what's the ethical legacy that I have? What are the good feelings that I have? How did they manage to love strongly and powerfully in the midst of terrible losses and terror and tragedy? Maybe I want to keep all that and I want to I want to bring that to the world and spread that in the world. But also, oh, you know, my anger that I feel and my victimization that I'm going around with and holding a grudge and a grievance everywhere, I can kind of let go of that because it's really not mine. It It's but what happened to my great grandparents or my grandparents. It's time to let go of that. This is not working for me. People are mad at me all the time. I'm not close to anybody. It's a very negative way to live. I'm always making a list of grievances. I don't want to live like that anymore. Uh, I don't want to impose that on my children and my family and my friends and my workmates. So I can let go of that because I understand now where it came from and that those are old feelings that got passed down to me because nobody ever processed them. Nobody ever understood where they came from and what you keep about this because it's precious and it's good 
and what you let go of. The other issue that I know Tuesday's children worked on very, very early, and is a more complicated question that we can talk about, is when you have these legacies, and I want to emphasize that when you start thinking this way and thinking about your family system, you realize that most of you have some story somewhere, and also that you're a participant in other people's stories. We're not all victims. Sometimes we've done things that aren't good in the course of very difficult times, and we may need, our family made it, needed to make amends, and did we ever do that, and how are we trying to do that now? So um, we all have stories, and one of the questions becomes, how do you tell your, your children and grandchildren enough of this story along the way so you don't overburden them and terrify them, but at every appropriate developmental phase, you answer a few questions very gently as your children can handle more, as your adult children ask questions or are puzzled by them things. Dad, why do we have tuna fish cans behind the books and the bookcases? That you explain something and uh, that you explain it in a way that is they're ready for. And particularly when children are growing, emphasizes also the good, right? Like terrible things can happen but there are good people who help each other when those things happen. And that's what gets us through everything. Like there were the firemen on 9-11, right? So it's important to transmit these stories in terms not just of the negativity that weighs on everybody and frightens us or uh, is very dark, but to convey the awesomeness of human courage and love and care and resourcefulness. So when my patient uh, looked at those tuna fish, his children and grandchildren see the tuna fish cans, that's not just a story about starvation and terror. It's a story about how we survive and we're creative in our survival. Even it looks a little strange to the next generation, a little odd, a little, uh, you know, my, my grandparents, if I took a subway ride, they would want to insist that I take food with me on the subway because you never know what's going to happen, right? Uh, there might not be food. And I'm like, I don't need food on the subway. It's a 15 minute subway trip. There's food everywhere in New York. I didn't get food anywhere. No, no, you've got to take this food, right? And it was crazy and it was sweet and it was nurturing and it was caring and it was from their trauma. And it was something to do with the way they survived. Humor is another thing that's very, very important. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I want to uh, take questions. I don't know what exactly how we're gonna do the format. I don't know if you, uh, Catherine, wanted to take comments or questions at this point or just go straight into the panel. And I leave that to you. Thank you, Dr. Grand. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story um, and your insights. Um, I, I really <laughs> like how you talked about how we inherit trauma, but we also inherit <laughs> strength and resilience. Um, if anyone has questions for Dr. Grand, you can put them in the chat. Um, we will have a Q&A portion at the end of our panel. Um, so you can put them there. I will monitor questions. Um, but we're going to move on to the panel discussion. Um, and I'm excited to introduce you to our moderator for today, Amy Bashat. Amy is an experienced journalist based in Palmer, Alaska. So thank you, Amy, for joining us so early this morning. Um, she is the former executive editor of military.com. She's a subject matter expert in military and veteran issues. Amy is the spouse of a disabled combat veteran and the mom of two military kids. She has personally experienced the impacts of traumatic loss through in and around the military community. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. I'm going to hand it over to you for our panel discussion today. Well, thank you so much to you for having me uh, and for letting me join you for such an important and really impactful conversation. I'm excited to ask to talk, have this panel today because uh, Dr. Grant, I have questions for you just for myself. So um, I will maybe selfishly ask some of those as we go on, uh, because as you were talking, I, of course, thinking about my own family, about my own uh, past. Sure. Experience, as I'm sure Absolutely. so many people here 
were yeah. today. Yeah. So um, we already heard from Dr. Grant. So I'm going to not introduce uh, you, Dr. Grant, again, because we heard your bio at the beginning. And of course, your really interesting presentation there. Instead, I'm going to roll into introducing our other panelists. We have the bevy of really incredible people with us today with a lot of rich experience in this topic. Uh, and then we're going to ask some of, they're going to ask questions of the entire panel. And then as uh, Captain mentioned, we'll take questions at the end from, or even, maybe even on an ongoing basis, depends what's going on from the chat. Uh, and really going to have an almost hour conversation today with this panel and really dive into this issue. So first, I'm going to start by initial, um, excuse me, introducing Ashley Bisman. Ashley is an award-winning author of a really rich memoir, Chasing Butterflies. In the, her book, she shares her experience as a teenager where she lost her father on 9-11. Uh, she was 16 year old, 16 years old when her father, Jeffrey Goldflam, was killed on the 101st floor of the North Tower. She's been featured in discussions involving overcoming tragedy with the Today Show, CBX, CBS, Fox, The Morning Show Australia, The Wall Street Journal, and Sports Illustrated. So really like a breadth of publications there. Um, Ashley holds a master's degree from Hunter College and a bachelor's degree in journalism from the Pennsylvania State University. And she's working on a sequel to Chasing Butterflies, uh, and also her first novel. Um, she plans to publish a children's book to help explain the events of 9-11 to young children. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next, we have Corey Weathers. She's a licensed professional counselor, a sought-after speaker, an award-winning author, and a consultant. She's really focused her career for the last two decades as a clinician specializing in marriage, military culture, special forces, and leadership development. She's traveled internationally to visit troops and report on deployment conditions and taught service families from across the globe, including me, by the way. Uh, in addition to providing her subject matter expertise on military culture, Corey consults organizations and institutions on building trust, creating impactful programming, and working within a multi-generational team, so subject at hand. Her advocacy has included being a part of Second Lady Karen Pence's Military Spouses Employment Working Group, the government loves long titles, uh, and contributing to the passing of a congressional bill for licensure portability. So Corey, thank you so much for being with us today. And finally, but not last but not least, we have Dr. Marty Cooper. Dr. Cooper is an adjunct faculty member of NYU Steinhardt and an associate professor at State University of New York College at Old Westbury in the graduate mental health counseling program. He is both a counseling psychologist, a licensed mental health counselor with regional and international experience, and his research focuses on sexual orientation and gender identity, so two very important topics. His most recent work is a new identity development model for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals, which will be published in a journal of studies in gender and sexuality. And he's also co-editor on the journal group. Dr. Cooper is the clinical, clinical, sorry guys, clinical director at Cooper Mental Health Counseling, PLLC. Among numerous volunteer activities, because he sounds like he has a lot of time on his hands, Dr. Cooper conducts asylum assessments for LGBTQ plus individuals seeking asylum in the U.S. He also engages in leadership activities in Division 17 of the American Psychological Association and Easter Group Psychotherapy Society. So y'all are some people with a lot of time on your hands. That's what I'm picking up here. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today and uh, and taking these questions. Dr. Grant, I really would love to come back to you first and just kind of talk about what transgenerational trauma looks like specifically in communities that are impacted by recent big traumatic events like 9-11, mass violence that we're unfortunately seeing across the U.S. what feels like all the time, and sweeping military loss. Can you can you talk specifically about those things and how we're seeing that impact this this topic? Oh, so, uh, Dr. Ken, you are on mute, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah, so you want to know about more recent events, but 9-11, we already have generations mm. uh, you're also talking about what about now you're talking about right now um yes. you know part of the problem that i think we're all very aware of first of all there is so much I mean, it depends on how you define trauma but there's so much trauma going on and it, it is affecting everybody in a very micro uh level way every day right um 
just everything is more scarce. Everything's more non-functional. Everybody feels <clears throat> everything is more precarious. Uh, everybody feels a sense of uncertainty and that the future is dark and closing down and uh, that the, things are very unstable and that they're going to get more unstable. And there's reason to feel that way. I mean, you just look at climate change, you look at the wars, you look at um, the tremendous uh, polarization and hostility, for example, in this country, uh, where people can't find a way to talk to each other and find common ground about issues that concern almost everybody, uh, where things, you know, the uh, levels of rage, the potential for violence um, is enormous. And part of what you're seeing, I think, in our, if you just look at the United States and what we're going through right now, the level of the, the heat and the sense that we're on the brink possibly of like, you know, civil war, families not talking to each other, friends not talking to each other anymore, uh, people unable to talk across their, their, their uh, political party, anything like that, um, because everything is so extreme and so full of rage, right? The rage level that accompanies the feeling of insecurity, of feeling, um, especially for people, let's emphasize, who have had the luck to have pretty safe lives, right? White, middle class, your generations were okay. You know, there was never never a question, you're going to have a home, you're going to have a job, uh, that kind of thing. The basics were secure. Um, people like that who have never confronted these things are suddenly themselves feeling endangered. So what happens when you feel frightened like that and in some ways shamed like that, let's say for people who find it much harder to get a job, suddenly want to work. People getting out of college right now, it's getting a job, how's that going to happen? Uh, and they lost their high school years and graduation to pa the pandemic. The tendency is to become... Um, enraged, easily enraged, easily reactive, very uh, worried about your, you know, closing in on your own little group, your own little family, taking care of your own little world, just me, 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 us, right? Huddling in your own group, organizing your world according to us versus them, Democrats versus Republicans, this versus that, everything is uh, like that uh, because you feel like now other people are such a, a danger to you. They're going to eat up all the resources or whatever it is. So the capacity to be generous, the capacity to be patient, uh, the capacity to understand other people, to share, right, to not live in terror, to and to reckon with the fact, yes, we are in a very insecure time and climate change will get worse and the refugee crisis is getting worse. But how do we want to live with that? You know, what kind of life do we want? Do we want to be antagonistic and just worrying about ourselves and grabbing, you know, for ourselves? Or do we want to be generous? Do we want to share? Do we want to bond? We need to make community. We need to get away from that. Um, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that we have an opportunity to be pro, like to proactively address this ongoing weight that we're experiencing and the traumas that are happening to us on a rolling basis yes. and that if we by talking about it we can say hey like i'm not gonna let this be like i'm feeling these way this way and i'm feeling some kind of way but i'm not gonna let this be baggage that i fill up and then tote around with me for the rest of my life and then pass off as an inheritance to my kid and that that's a um ongoing conversation that you have to be having and acknowledging is that that's kind of what exactly, you're Exactly, exactly. Not only that I don't want to pass, I, I don't want to, I have a choice. Yes, there's going to be worse climate change. Am I going to be somebody who helps my community when things happen and go on being someone who, who lives in kindness? Or am I going to become testy and angry and greedy and, you know, keep every crumb for myself? And what am I going to teach my children with that, Right. Because my children are facing that. How? How? Am, and also, I just want to say, I find that everybody's level of tension is like higher. And even just helping people identify, you know, the world has gotten much more difficult. So of course you're more testy. 
there's more road rage, right? If you can just label that, you know, and, and also if we can address not only our children, but I make a practice everywhere I go, I try to express empathy, interest, caring, sympathy, good cheer to the checkout lady at the supermarket where I just went, right? Because then she's going to be in a better mood. She'll feel treated with kindness and she's gonna treat the next customers that way, even though she has to stand on her feet all day and she's having a hard time. So the, yeah. it's only if we really know what we're facing and face it together that we can make those choices. We don't face it and recognize that we have two paths in front of us, that we have to choose the better one. Yeah. And help our children develop the strengths, right? Because they're inheriting all this anxiety. Yeah. For those of us who experienced 9-11, I, I, it's, you said, you noted that it's already <laughs> multi-generational. And I was like, oh yeah, because it was not yesterday, even though I think in so many right. ways it does feel like yesterday and also so long ago at the same time, the service through of military families through 20 years of war is very similar. Um, and so Corey, I wanted to ask you um, a question about that, you know, with those more than two decades, many military families who have served in the Middle East over two generations. Uh, parents are passing down this tradition of service to their kids, but are they also passing down a tradition of participating in global conflict? And if so, how mm. can families disrupt that and learn to just, you know, not not serve, but be still and take a beat without just perpetually participating in global mm. conflict? Yeah, thank you, Amy. And thank you so much for having me. And um, Dr. Grand, thank you so much for your presentation. So, so good. And um, and I'll probably try to tie in some of the words and phrases that you were also saying, because I think um, it's absolutely a great way, to, I think, to kind of answer this question. And so there's two parts to this question. Number one is, are we as a military community um, passing down this idea of continuing in conflict? And so I think when you ask that question, I just kind of want to pull it back so that everybody can can relate to it, regardless if you're in the military community or not. And I think that all of us as human beings really love patterns. We really love um, to do what is comfortable. Most of us in our own relationships, in our own families can find ourselves in unhealthy patterns that we want to get out of and we're miserable in those patterns, but we really struggle to get into a new healthier pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that this is really important when we study bigger cultures, when we talk about not just a person, not just a family and those generations, but also a whole culture, how cultures can pass down a pattern or pass mm -hmm. down a way of thinking, pass down, you know, Dr. Grand brought up a great point of how do we actually define trauma? Mm -hmm. So I think we also need to bring that in here too, because I, I know as I was listening to Dr. Grand, even I, as a clinician, am like having to go through, man, there's been so many people who've been through such terrible, horrific things in history. And I think any of us listening would kind of have this response of, well, maybe the things that I have gone through don't compare. And so I can't say, you know, that I would have the same generational trauma. And so there is a lot more awareness, like Dr. Grant said, of what is trauma and how we define trauma. Some people say big T trauma and little T trauma. Yeah. And I have a good friend of mine who is married to a veteran with a, a very severe TBI and also has a child with Down syndrome who's been through countless surgeries. And sometimes I ask her, like, how are you even functioning? You know, and or how can I even complain to you about my life when you're going through something so much more difficult and tragic? And she always says to me, Suffering is subjective and your difficulty, your suffering is important and real to you, just like my difficulty is important and difficult for me. And we can't compare those. So I just want to start off for those that are listening, what we're talking about changing patterns and looking about at how does this pass down applies to all of us. And also like Dr. Rand said, starting with that self-awareness is critical. And so to answer your question, um, Amy, I think that we, what we're seeing in the military community as a whole culture is we have been in a state of compounding stress for two decades, now plus. And I think a lot of the community expected us to, after the Afghanistan withdrawal, go into a peacetime. And what they actually found is we're going into what we call a gray zone where it's neither peace nor war. Um, it's, it's a constant state of readiness. And so what we're seeing is 
kind of two different generational responses. We're seeing some that really do not want to continue to pass down this state, this pattern, this familial pattern of living in constant stress, which would be very easy. <laughs> I even, even in our family, we're an active duty family. Once like the Afghanistan withdrawal like happened, once we had a little bit of stability, once our kids started to do, to do just a little bit better, Matt and I had so much stress in our bodies. We didn't know how to slow ourselves down, even though everybody was fine. And we had to be very self-aware to go, do we stay at this state of just going because it's what we've done for 20 years? Or do we actually teach our bodies, tend to the trauma and stress in our bodies and teach ourselves how to be still so that we don't run our children into the ground just because we were comfortable in a pattern that we were miserable in, but it's just what we were living in for so long. So the second part to that question is that while there are some generations, I would say generation X that are really discouraging their Gen Z kids from even joining the military, because we're kind of saying "Time out, this is enough. Mm -hmm. We're seeing others in military leadership roles who, because they are in a system where OERs and that next promotion to provide for their family means that they have to show that whoever they're in charge of is, is ready for the next war, is ready and trained. There is this real temptation for what we call next war-itis or what we, the twin of that, which is last war-itis. Again, that just means staying in the same pattern because we've always been in it. And so we are seeing some leaders really struggling with, can we actually be still? Or do we just stay in the state of being constantly ready for the next thing or constantly responsive to the next thing? That brings up a whole slew of questions that we won't have time to address today about should we be involved in everything that we're involved with and how do we actually bring peace time to our country? Mm -hmm. um, but I will just end with saying, I really wanna go back to, with, with, to what Dr. Grant started with, which is number one, being self-aware of what you're experiencing in your own body to ask yourself, do I need to be at this like state, at this pace? Is there room for me to slow down? And then how do I actually teach myself to be still, to be present? And that if we can pass these patterns down generationally, to her point, we can just as easily pass them out around us in real time to the grocery store, you know, mm -hmm. person at the register or to your barista or whatever. Like these, these states of your attitude and your mental well-being easily pass around to other people as you interact with them. Yeah, I think I think two things. You made such an important point about uh, what I've heard termed the bummer Olympics. Like there isn't that, and so uh, there is no contest for who has it who has it worse. It's it's possible to dwell in empathy and compassion for um, everyone's Olympic experience uh, in this subject, um, and that that term has just really stuck with me because it really does feel like that sometimes. And then another thing that Dr. Grant said earlier that you just touched on is this, um, the chronic victim story. I actually yes. wrote it down because I was like, yes, Ooh, that's really good. And I think we, you know, I'm a military family member too, very involved in the veteran community. That is something we absolutely see in the veteran and military community. Yes. And that is something that's made worse because, or made more apparent might be a better way to say that because uh, of the um a passing down of service um i just had this like uh as i was saying this i thought of uh forrest gump and lieutenant yeah. dan's family right and so he really wanted to go to war and not come home because that's what his family did yes. um, and i think there's some re really interesting rabbit trail we could get off on on that but the reason that that resonates is because that's so that's so real life for many many military families. Actually, yeah. I want to turn to you uh, and to talk a little bit about this because uh, you are have firsthand experience in 9-11. And I just really want to say, first of all, to start with um, how sorry I am for the loss of your father, Jeffrey, um, and, and that experience that you had. Um, but, you know, with two decades between us and 9-11, and I'm wondering what some of the long-term impacts of that day are on the survivors and descendants and you have children. So, you know, generational descendants, um, like yourself. Yes. Yeah. So they, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And, um, you know, when I hear that question, it's interesting because when you say the long-term effects of that day and how it impacts you, 
you know, it never goes away. So every year, um, every decade brings new reminders. Um, so since I lost my dad when I was 16, um, you know, the first big milestone was graduation from high school and then graduation from college. Um, in more recent years, you know, my dad was not here to walk me down the aisle at my wedding. Um, and he has never met my children. I have a six and a four year old. And um, so I'm constantly reminded of the milestones that my dad is missing. And um, now my children, you know, especially my six year old, she's very curious and she asks me where my dad is and how he died. And um, for many years, I avoided the question because there really is no great way to explain to a toddler, you know, where my father is. But more recently, um, I found myself, I actually was on a rooftop in the city. I was with my daughter and we were looking at all the buildings and pointing to them. Mm -hmm. And she pointed to the Freedom Tower and she mm -hmm. said, oh, what's what's that? And I actually like, I just felt it in my heart that it was the right time. And I said, that building is where my daddy was and he passed away in that building and they've rebuilt it now. And I tried to explain it in a way where Dr. Grand really hit on this very well, that even though there's tragedy, there's also good sides of everything. And so I said to her, even though my daddy passed away and many people passed away, there were a lot of survivors and there were heroes and there were firefighters and police officers and everyday people who helped everyone get out of the building. And I really focused on that. And when I finished speaking with her, it was pretty incredible because I took a pause and I was like, okay, I either scarred her for life or, or this person. <laughs> and it really, she, I feel like she took away the best parts of that story to the point where we were driving in the car a few days later. And she was like, mommy, mommy, tell my friend about your daddy in the building. And I was like, okay, let's not, <laughs> you know, I don't know how. I don't know how your friend's parents have explained that to her, but, you know, it was nice to see that she wasn't scared and she thought it was interesting and she took away all of the good parts of it. Um, and so, yeah, 9-11 um, always follows me and is always with me. And I just think it's my job to embrace the positives of it. So I try my best not to carry on that, mm -hmm. that generational trauma as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's it can feel like a really tricky needle to thread, right? Like not mm -hmm. minimizing the tragedy while also peeling out the mm -hmm. the good things or what they called in my mm -hmm. my son's preschool or preschool the community helpers. I love mm -hmm. that you emphasize that, but that that can feel really because you don't want to be like, oh, this you know we're gonna not focus on the bad and just on the good. You want right. to honor both things, and that oh, I mean, as a parent, that feels so so tricky to thread. Uh, Marty, I'm hoping actually you can talk to a little bit about this because what Ashley just talked about was communicating, you know, like we said, the, the good and the tragic at the same time. Um, I'm wondering if that's a thing that we're learning generation, generationally. Wow, that's a tough word uh, now. Um, and if there's maybe a difference between how millennial and Gen Z folks work through trauma and loss or even generations before. Um, whether that be military or first responder or otherwise, and and how that um, that difference influences generations as you know they go forward, um, like is how we communicate the weight of this or don't communicate it because I think we've seen that too mm -hmm. based on what Dr. Grand was saying, change how we see this going forward. What mm -hmm. do you think? And yeah, maybe, thanks, well, Amy. Um, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about your story, Marty. Oh, yes. I, 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 I know, Marty and I know each other. Okay, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Tell us a little bit about your story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and and I'm sure this will come up in, in some of the questions, but I come from a mixed Indigenous background, um, Native American and white, which is part of, um, you know, I was listening to Dr. Grand's story and kind of thinking through mine as I'm listening to that as well of, of how that has impacted my experience and continues to impact my experience. Um, and I, I do think this question mark of cohorts is very interesting because there is something we, we refer to as a cohort effect. Mm -hmm. um, things that happen uh, that impact uh, specific cohorts, uh, in this case, Gen Z or millennial 
-hmm. And there can be some trends in that that we see. But at the same time that we see trends, uh, especially as a clinician, I really want to get close to the individual. Mm -hmm. And I think a recent one that we've been through, which was the pandemic, Mm -hmm. and working with adolescents or youth during the pandemic was very interesting to see. Here we have a cohort trend happening in real time, and I'm seeing very different experiences of it, Mm -hmm. which was fascinating to see. And a lot of that was hinged on access to resources Mm -hmm. and to see how some youth were wrapped around with resources and some families maybe had the resources to create pods or some of these things that were happening. In those instances, the impact of that cohort effect of the pandemic is going to be a different experience than somebody whose parents were losing their jobs due to the pandemic and were uh, fearful of losing their home. This gets encoded in a very, very different way. Um, So I guess kind of coming back to the heart of your question, the families that have those access to resources and are able to wrap themselves around their children, that is an amazing thing if that can happen. And I think we're gonna see a very, very different developmental trajectory. even seeing how the schools responded in my experience was radically different. Um, having youth that were on Upper East Side Manhattan private schools, that day one, the school outlined exactly how everything was going to happen. All the resources were provided. Um, we're taking care of you, uh-huh. I think might have been the experiential part of that for the youth. They were being taken care of even in this great adversity. Whereas another child in New York City school district child that may be getting materials mailed, literally mailed to them, um, and no access to their teachers and this sort of thing, am I being taken care of in the face of tragedy, in the face of very traumatic experience? And again, I kind of come back to that developmental piece of what does that do moving forward then? What might or might not be passed on to subsequent generations? Um, Mm -hmm. So that's part of what stands out to me in in this idea of this cohort effect. It, I really do need to get very specific with the individual and what their experience was. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would love to hear more about your perspective from an indigenous community um, and, and how indigenous communities understand and cope with this transgenerational trauma of which there is plenty, um, especially in the context <laughs> of those historic events such as colonization and forced assimilation. And and maybe you could share what you know what you see as lessons that can be um taken for for the greater uh, American society through that experience, if you don't mind. Absolutely. And um I'm gonna try to keep myself in my lane, which is my current work is focusing on mixed indigenous, which okay. might be very different than um individuals that live on the nations. Um so the mixed indigenous, and right now I'm focusing on white Native American mix. There are other mixes, but um, uh, part of the reasoning for that, we can thank Sue Grand, who um, wrote literally the article um, on this, um, specifically speaking about white shame and Native American genocide. Um, the first time I saw that, I had never seen an article like this in the analytic literature, and to still have not. Um, and I've researched it well um, for an upcoming presentation that I have. But that is emblematic of part of the problem, mm-hmm. has been the erasure of the trauma that happened mm-hmm. and a, an erasure and a falsification of the history. Mm-hmm. So my suspicion and probably part of my lived experience is mixed indigenous folk maybe not knowing that there is a something to be looked at here Mm -hmm. maybe having been raised in my case i mean you know we can all see the color of my skin i'm pretty pale right so i was raised only with some stories some loose stories in the background and then learned more across time um about how impactful that history was and you know, utilizing myself as the example, you know, there's a reason I was the first gen to college in my family. And that had nothing to do with the intelligence of anyone else in the family. It was about survival and the choices the family had to make in order to 
come back to the word survive, just in order to survive, mm -hmm. um, which pulls in concepts like passing. Right? So on my father's side, that side was always white passing. My mother's side is not. Um, but that also can contribute to the erasure, right? So in, in, in my instance, um, I do not know what our family name was. The passing happened in such a way that the, my father's side could pass as white. And so they adopted the last name Cooper. We have no, somebody I think in the family knows, but we won't speak about it. But um, this is that transmission. This is how it unfolds. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it gets to a generation like mine and having no grounding in um, that traumatic history. Um, that being said, so I, I think that the, for mixed indigenous, I think that it may get missed and unarticulated, unformulated. I, I think um, Corey was speaking to this. I think Dr. Grand was speaking to this about sometimes the lack of language mm -hmm. that we have to communicate this. It is a experiential thing that happens within our bodies often that is unformulated. Um, I think one thing that we can keep an eye out for within the mixed indigenous is is there also something that was handed down intergenerationally about indigenous ways of healing? Mm -hmm. And can we keep our eye out to see what those might be for an individual? Um, going through my history, part of that for me was dance. I was a classical ballet dancer prior to becoming a psychologist. And if you look back at my choreography, you can see the themes that I was working through that I didn't know needed to be worked through. It was very unconscious, but it did find its way into the work. So I suspect I probably complicated your question more than clarified it. But <laughs> no, no, I, I think you just touched on something really you did not. And but I think you also touched on something very important here, which is this communication, which is actually a perfect on ramp to what I was about to ask uh, Dr. Grant, which is about communication. You know, I, as a parent, struggle to talk about my own trauma and communicate yeah. that, mm -hmm. that to my children. And boy, do I wish that there would just be some sort of generational pass down of knowledge. I wouldn't have to articulate that because that would make that just all oh, way yeah. easier. But right. it strikes me as you're talking that one of the one of the ways we can stop the madness, if you will, is by learning how to communicate. You talked about and Ashley talked about like having these moments of conversation. But I'm I, you know, for, for Ashley, that kind of just happened for you, which is like magical and wonderful and created this beautiful moment mm -hmm. that you shared. Now you have this memory and your daughter picked up what you were laying down. But I don't know. And so maybe this is a selfish question for me, but I'm hoping other people watching this have the same question. I don't know how to have a path to those that clear communication without the moment magically materializing. And I don't know how to find those moments where I say to my sons, oh, you know, uh, this is part of our family story. And don't just assume that they've picked it up from the air at some point. Um, because, because I, you know, right. I was surprised recently, for example, when my son said to me, I, you know, I, I was talking to somebody at our church and I shared some stuff about my husband and I's background is very, um, very like a religious cults kind of setting. And when we walked away, my 14 year old said, I had no idea about any of that. And I was like, how did you not know that? Like, I just thought we all knew that, you know? And so share with us, like, give us a practical, like, how do you well, do it? You know, um, I'm, I'm happy to help. And I think everybody here can help you and all of us with this. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to also go back for a second to what Corey was talking about, because I think Corey, you said something really important. I'm um, also, besides everything else, of course, my father was a traumatized war vet, right? Mm -hmm. And there were dark sides of him that were perpetually raging and, uh, could be violent and the question of how do we care for people while it, where there's a war going on when they're stationed and they're but they're in a um readiness mode right they can't ever just because if you are if you're always in readiness then the only thing that makes sense is is as you said the next war right and how do you get out of that consciousness so we don't keep repeating war. Even that if you wanna be a hero uh, as an antidote to your history, but does a hero, do you need a war to be a hero, right? Do you need to go to combat to be a hero? 
Um, so how do we escape from this long cycle of one war after another? I thought that was a great point. And how do we stop living as if we're, we're activated in trauma and keep communicating that so that the only thing that makes sense is like a, an edgy, dangerous world. So to go back to your question about how do we communicate, one way of thinking about this, and nothing can be generalized, but if you're not frightened of your child knowing something or having to tell them, then it's at every developmental age, you may see an opportunity, a way, I mean, Ashley, your child asked the perfect question at the perfect time and it was the perfect answer, right? But you know, children do ask questions, they are curious about things, and if you're ready to give them some of your background, you can take those opportunities, and it doesn't have to be an explicit question. The other thing is, talk more about your history in general around the family. You've got family pictures, or you're, you don't have a family picture of so-and-so because there aren't any, or, you know, talk more openly about the cultural background you came from because that's likely to give them uh, a framework for this and an opening for questions. Uh, and just, again, to be careful that you do it at a developmentally appropriate level and you're not flooding them with more than they need to know at every level. And also it's good to label an affect. I mean, Ashley, I think it was implicit in what you said to your child, but you know, you can just say, I, I miss my daddy sometimes you know, and I wish he knew you, he would be so proud of you, like something like that, right? So you you retain a feeling of attachments are intact, even if daddy's gone, and you can label a feeling, it's very important to label a feeling, because children pick up feelings, you know, to just say, sometimes I'm sad, you know, maybe on an event when daddy's not there, you know, your child senses something, you might just say, it's a wonderful time, and I wish my daddy was here to see you do this right um so you know it, it, we tend not to say anything also because it feels so explosive to us mm -hmm. the closer you are to the survivor generation the more raw and explosive it feels what you have to tell right and that's why it feels like a nuclear bomb if you open up the subject but if you just talk you know generally about like i had a weird cult i didn't go to school like you did you know just it's great how you're going to school. It wasn't like that when I went. You know, it's it's a it normalizes having these conversations. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for for you, I imagine for the survivor of the of the experience and for the for the child. Um, I, you know, I'd actually love to hear from every panelist on this question because uh, somebody in the chat, Tara, notes that her father was also killed on 9/11. I'm sorry, Tara, I don't know his name. Uh, yeah. And that she, he was a firefighter and she has seven-year-old twins who she's trying to have conversations about this with, but she uh, is, no, she says she's noticing some anxious behavior specifically when they have no known exposure to an environment or a situation. Uh, and she's looking for tools to communicate. So I just would love it if all of, if all of you would weigh in on this. And Ashley, since, since you um, have the closest experience to Tara, I don't know if you have any lived experience that you can share on this while, while acknowledging that I, you know, mm -hmm. that we're sort of building the airplane sometimes in our own lives as we go, or it sure can feel that, but we also Absolutely. have tools. So yeah. what do you, what do you think? Uh, uh, well, I also have a very anxious six-year-old, so mm -hmm. I, I feel her pain. Um, as far as it's 9-11 related, um, I try not to pass on that trauma specifically with airplanes and with like tall buildings, for example. So like, you know, I make sure that we fly a lot. We fly often when there's turbulence, even if I hate it, I have a smile on my face because it's going to be okay, you know. Um, and, um, you know, when we're going up to in the city and we're going up really high to my husband's office, you know, I want her to instill these comforts so that as the years go on and she learns more about 9-11, she won't have those fear of the fear of fire, the fear of buildings, the fear of flying, because I'm trying to instill in her now that, you know, it is safe and it is okay. Um, and then I don't know if this is 9-11 related, but just dealing with the anxiety of my six-year-old, I always try to prepare her as much as I can if I know we're going into a place where there's loud noises or there's a lot of people because that's what frightens her. 
you know, I try and communicate with her as much as I can beforehand and prepare her for the situation that's happening so that when we go into it, she is less anxious. And I also think it's okay when they do experience that, that anxiety and they are kind of freaking out a little bit. I don't think there's anything wrong with pulling your child out of the situation, letting them take a, take a deep breath, teaching them how to self-soothe. And then when they're ready to try again, we go back in. And so that's how I deal with a lot of my daughter's anxieties. So Ashley, I just want to say that's perfect because you don't want to fix every anxiety. Kids mm -hmm. are going to have anxieties. What you want to build is exactly what you're doing. A sense that, okay, if, it, if I'm feeling like it's too much, I can take a break. I can self-soothe. I can think of mechanisms that will help me in, in difficult situations. So I have some internal resilience and strengths to bring to situations that life has anxieties in it right uh and to prepare kids as much as you can but what you were saying amy is you know if there's an uncertain situation you know to just describe that you know we can all be a little scared when we don't know exactly what it's going to be like but uh you know and to build the strength of you know uh not only i'm here there are always nice people there there's and what else can you do right so that they have you want them to have actual experience it of some anxiety and be able to have like tools in their pocket for when they get bigger. So I would, I don't love to respond to it if it's okay, Amy. Yeah. Um, I think that when we, when we go through anything traumatic or really intensely stressful, maybe we can think of it from a biopsychosocial perspective. And a lot of what um, everybody's hearing, I think the theme in the panel is really the, um, the social part of not only what happened to you when you went through the trauma as you're closest to that survivor experience, um, but it's also how, how do we heal intergenerational trauma is that social component of how do I have these conversations? Like Marty was saying, how do we bring awareness? How do we talk about it? And anytime we're talking about forgiveness, reconciliation, anytime we're talking about how to heal this generational trauma, there is this, how do we talk about it? How do we speak the truth? How do we share our stories? And that's a really great social perspective. Um, to speak to the anxiety, there's also a lot of research coming out on the bio, the biological component of what happens to our bodies in stress. And so what they're finding in research is that, again, whether it's a big trauma or whether it's compounded stress, like we've seen in the military culture, that whenever you go through something stressful, hormones just are just rise in your body in order for you to survive or get through that experience. And so on the other side of that, what we're seeing is low cortisol. And whenever you have low cortisol on the end of that, um, you have... A, you have a reduced ability to handle stressful situations, which means your anxiety goes up, your irritability goes up, weight gain can happen. We're seeing that in the military culture after these two decades. We're not only seeing low cortisol from your veterans, but you're also seeing lo low cortisol in spouses as well who have endured long, large amounts of stress over time. And so there's also research, by the way, low cortisol impacts all your other hormones. So we're also seeing in veterans, because of that low cortisol, you're seeing low testosterone, which is all of those symptoms of your hormones being that low is actually mimicking or showing symptoms of PTSD-like symptoms. So we're really trying to look at, is it really PTSD or is it actually a hormone imbalance that we can actually treat or is it both? So the last piece of research I want to share is that we're actually seeing what they call intergenetic epigenetic, epigenetic pathways. So they're studying from a maternal perspective, when the baby is in utero, if that mother is going through stress and those hormones rise and low cortisol, whether it was in the Holocaust survivors or even post 9-11, what we're looking at or what they're looking at is for those children, low cortisol levels from the start. Mm -hmm. And they're also looking at through the father as well. Um, does it pass down as well? And they're also finding a genetic component from the father as well, passing to two generations. There was a really interesting study done on mice where they did an electric shock on mice when they were smelling cherry blossoms. And then they passed, they looked at the 
next two generations past that generation. And there was still a fear around cherry blossoms, even though they had never been exposed to cherry blossoms or the electric shock at all. So basically what we're seeing is not only a passing down of potential low cortisol levels from the from the parent who went through that stress down to maybe even two generations who might struggle with anxiety, struggle with some of those symptoms of low cortisol or inability to handle stress. But we're also seeing some of these odd, like the panel has talked about already, some of these odd responses that we don't know where they're coming from. So I guess the last thing I would just say is from a biopsychological, a biopsychosocial perspective as parents, how can we be self-aware? How can we be mindful of what's happening in our bodies? How can we take a look at how do we actually, there's some great, I'm not a doctor, but over-the-counter ways and mindfulness ways to recover your adrenal gland and help those cortisol levels come back to normal. But how do we look at this from a holistic perspective and maybe just maybe some of those anxiety responses we're seeing or some of the situational responses that you're seeing to anxiety, fire, planes, mm -hmm. What, and some some that Dr. Grand gave an example of, that those could be genetic carriers over time. Right, and you know, one of the things that's most, that's also very important about that psychosocial uh, body research is that one of the things that ameliorates these experiences is social empathy. Yes love attachment is critical the sense yes. of what marty was talking about about the difference between kids in an elite school who at the pandemic felt very taken care of and surrounded by resources and that part of the problem that we have in our culture is that we're not taking care of people so mm -hmm. we just don't take care there are certain people who get that care most people don't and um that it, that's the thing that along with physiological interventions and meditation and psychotherapy and everything but that's the thing that's the sort of baseline of what's going to allow people to heal to quiet their reactivity um to feel safer and and not to keep transmitting this right uh the other thing i just want to say is that you can't, as a parent or whatever, always hide, let's say, that you're anxious on a plane. So part of that, you know, if you can hide it well, great. Uh, but if, you can, if you're having a little trouble and you have a child who knows it, because children can be very loving and say, mommy, you okay, right? It's okay to label your feeling. That when you label it again in the context of, I just get a little nervous when I'm flying, but, you know, then you say how safe planes yeah. are and you know, you're going to have a really exciting time. It's also really fun. And, but I did, yeah, I'm just getting a little anxious when I fly. Yeah. Well, and Marty, you, uh, you talked about the holistic um, side of this that Corey was just touching on as well. Um, when you mentioned your experience with dance and looking mm -hmm. to culture to help with um, signals on how to heal from this stuff. And I'm wondering if you what your thoughts are on the question from the chat, which is about these tools to communicate, maybe from that ex perspective, but also mm -hmm. broadly or whatever you have to offer on that. And just, mm -hmm. I would really love to hear your perspective. One thing that's coming to mind is that this is really circling back to Dr. Grand's uh, uh, initial discussion about children creating stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to almost kind of give permission to anyone listening that I think our fear is how do I communicate our family history of trauma? We don't have to start there. Mm -hmm. We have to start with the stories of the family. Mm -hmm. right. We have to lay the foundation to the house. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, uh, this beautiful moment that Ashley shared with us, my assumption, and Ashley, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that that moment was able to exist because so many moments of the family stories prior to that existed. It creates a space for these questions to come up so that they're not being built out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But getting in the habit of telling the stories mm -hmm. helps the child have some stories to build around or they will do it on their own. Mm -hmm. we, they will develop their own stories on their own 
if we don't help them with that process. So I, again, I think it's just permission to say we don't have to start at the traumatic material. We can start with the family histories, build our way there. Right. That was a wonderful uh, point, Marty, because, yeah, it's like building the foundation to the house. It's like you saying, uh, Amy, I went to a weird school. I like your school. You know, um, just it's not a trauma story. It's just the color of your world that you were in. Uh, and I think you're right, Marty, that it, it enables kids to say, to be curious yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So we are coming sort of to the end of this. I don't know how we have gotten here so very quickly. Um, we do have one more question from the chat. Uh, uh, someone, Corey, someone asked if you could say more about what's available over the counter. I know you're, you're not a physician, um, so you may not be comfortable doing that, but, um, if you are great and if not, maybe you can refer them to another source. Yeah, definitely not a clinician um, or like a medical provider. Um, but I will say some of the things that are proving effective from an endocrine perspective, definitely, you know, you should go get your levels checked. You should um, have a doctor look at that. I know that that's a whole other conversation on the struggles, especially with hormones where it looks like it's in a normal range, but you don't feel well. So be an advocate to your own health. But we are seeing some improvement in cortisol levels and overall functioning when it comes to fatigues, um, irritability, some of those presence of low cortisol, especially those who are measuring low cortisol with things like adrenal support. There's some natural supplements that um, I, I did not mean to do that. Um, this, the, all these little bubbles, um, but there's, you know, I tried to turn Thumbs down for poor cortisol, thumbs up for everything. Yes, exactly. So, um, but adrenal support is really what you want to look for. Um, looking for more of a natural thing again, go to your doctor and check, but addressing the adrenal side of things can help, help your adrenal gland recover, which can raise your cortisol levels, which can then help with the other hormones if they are off. And so a lot of people are finding help with that. You can get that at GNC and some of your other um, drug stores. Again, talk with somebody first. Um, but there's a lot of veterans that are seeing um, that are actually measuring low in testosterone. And we know that um, insurance providers, if you are measuring low, um, are they're taking testosterone to address some of those PTSD issues. So again, if you feel irritable, tired, fatigued, if you if you're just not handling stress well, um, take a look at that. But especially, I just 100% agree with what everybody else here has said, that when we look at healing, um, reconciliation, forgiveness, moving forward, like any of those kinds of themes, it all comes down to human connection. It all comes down to sharing your stories, feeling that your stories have been heard. And that means we also need to be people that are willing to hear other people's stories, but it's the in the sharing of those stories. And, and I just want to like give a shout out to Marty that one of my favorite stories of healing intergenerational trauma that affects all of us or could is what we see in some of the ancient tribes where, especially for war heroes or those who have been through difficult things sent on behalf of, let's say, a village or a tribe, when they come home, they share their trauma with the village. And by doing so, the village shares in the responsibility and the burden of sending them in which they receive that trauma on their behalf. And so by sharing the trauma with them, we carry it together as a village and it helps with some of that healing because you're not other, you're not alone. And by saying suffering and trauma is subjective, we all know what it's like to go through it. When we share our stories of suffering, difficulty, and are willing to hear that from someone else, we normalize it. We don't erase the past. Like Marty said, we are really good at just letting history move forward and forgetting the, the valuable lessons of what's happened in the past. We need to share, we need to hear, and then we also need to figure out what can we do differently? How can we parent differently? How can we love ourselves differently and have enough value in our life and our next generation that we want to lead differently? So thank you guys so much for, for having me. I, I would just, um, I think it's a wonderful place to end because it's our kind of, you know, I think the ethical lesson that we need to learn from this is that we need to care for each other in a warm community and 
to witness each other's trauma, to help each other with each other's trauma, to, to hear and to tell. And also, Marty, I wanted to go back to you because you were talking about dance and that there are many ways to tell a story. And the body tells a story, not only the way, um, Corey, you're talking about in terms of the hormonal, uh, the genetic uh, legacies, right, and impact, but our bodies tell stories. And your body was telling a story through dance. So it's if you're a parent or a grandparent, you can also think about body ways to, to tell this story with somebody, to play with somebody, to do art. To There are all kinds of ways to do this uh, if, if for some reason verbal communication is not your gig or your child's uh, way of communicating. So, but it's all about care of ourselves and the other to create a warmer human community that holds trauma and stops passing it on. Thank you all so very much for your time. Uh, Corey, you're coming at me with my adrenal issues, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, uh, yeah, so I just, I really wanna thank each of you for weighing in here today with this really rich conversation. I myself have learned a lot, felt very confronted and also encouraged in many ways. Um, I'm gonna pass it back to Catherine, um, who's gonna walk us out of this conversation you so much, Amy and all of the panelists. What a powerful conversation. Um, I learned a lot from all of you. I will definitely be re-watching the recording to kind of process all the learnings and insights from the conversation today. Um, so just a reminder that this was recorded um, for anyone who's on the call who, I, who I may have missed a few minutes um, or if you want to share it with others um, because I know there is a lot of people that registered that we're not able to make it live today. So we will be sharing this. Um, we will share the recording with you. We will also be sharing an evaluation with you in the next couple of days. Um, if anyone has any additional questions for the speakers, um, you can pass those along to me um, and I will pass those questions along to them and we will get answers for you. Um, and I just wanna thank everybody for coming today. Thank you, Amy, you did an amazing job moderating. Thank you, Dr. Grand, Ashley, Dr. Cooper and Corey. Um, you were all wonderful and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. I just want to say thank you because I learned a lot from everybody and it was a very uh, moving conversation. So thank you for having me and it was great to meet you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you so much.